a review of test number two for chemistry 1412. The first part of the test was a match of definitions and words. So A says is a proton acceptor, and this basically is the definition of number three, the Branstad Lowry base. Um, B, the industrial preparation of ammonia. This is basically number nine, um, number seven, the uh, Haber process is a proton donor. This basically is an acid, but basically is the branstad lowry acid, the ones that uh, involves protons transfer. Okay, it's the ones I use that in the definition is a branstad lowry Consists of hydrogen, oxygen, and other and one other element, which is a nonmetal. That's the definition of oxide acids, number 10. It's a substance that when dissolves in water, increases the concentration of hydrogen ions that was one of the first definition of acid done by Arrhenius, that is number one. F is an electron pair donor. That definition is for the Lewis acid base definition, and specifically for the Lewis base uh, uh, definition. Letter G, when a reaction and its reverse reaction proceed at the same rate, we have reached here a chemical equilibrium, so that's number four, G. The H, electron pair accept acceptor, is basically the uh, Lewis acid definition, so it's number eight, letter H. Consists of hydrogen and one other element, this is the definition of a binary acid, six, letter I. And the last one is a substance that when dissolved in water, increases the concentration of hydroxide ions. This is the definition for a base of Arrhenius, basically the first definition that were established for base as well as the acid one, that we, as we mentioned before. The second part was a true or false. The first one says the effect, the effect of a catalyst on a chemical reaction is to react with a product, effectively removing it and shifting the equilibrium to the right. The catalyst doesn't react with the product. The catalyst, what it does is basically decrease the activation energy of the reaction, making the reaction faster. So that's why basically the first one is false. Number two, in an exothermic equilibrium reaction, increasing the reaction temperature favors the formation of the reactant. That's true or false? That is true. Why? Because in exothermic reaction, we have the temperature, and we can use the temperature as part of the of, of one of the species of the reactants or products of the reaction. And because it's an exothermic, we can put that energy uh, that, uh, in, the, in, the, in the products. So if you increase the reaction temperature, now that becomes a reactant as go from go going from to the left, so that will increase the formation of the reactant. So that's why it's true. Number three, pure gases are excluded from the equilibrium constant expression, and that is false because they are part of the equation. Number four, a Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor, and a Lewis base is an electron pair donor, and that is true. Number five, the amphotheric substance can act both an acid as an, as both an acid and a base and that is true and one example is water water can basically react as an acid or as an, as a base depending on the other reactants that are present in the reaction number 6 the pka of a buffered solution consisting of h2co3 and hco3- minus is 6.4 this is the pka for this weak acid at ph equals to 6.4 both uh, concentrations are going to be equal. That's true or false? And that is true. Okay, when we have both concentration equals, the pH is going to be equal to the pKa using basically the equation of uh, Henderson Hazelbach. So we can establish that the pH is going to be equal to the pKa when both concentrations are the same. Okay, so that's why number six is true. Number seven, the extent of ionization of a weak electrolyte is increased by adding to the solution a strong electrolyte that has an ion in common with the weak acid, with the weak electrolyte, sorry. This, if you have um, a weak electrolyte, is gonna be dissociated. The products are gonna be the ions. So if you add a strong electrolyte as an ion that is common, so you're gonna increase more the concentration of the products, shifting that to the left and making the electrolyte less uh, ionized. So that's why this one is false, because it's reducing the ionization of the weak electrolyte 
when you add this strong electrolyte to the solution because you're doing this increasing the concentration of a common ion that is in the products and because that is going to turn to the left and it, by that way it's going to decrease the ionization of the weak electrolyte. Number eight, the conjugated base of Ronsted Lowry acid H2, HPO4-2 is H2PO4-1. If this is the if this is the, the acid and you want to have the base, you need to remove one hydrogen. So it must be PO4-3. This is the conjugated acid of this base, basically. So that's why this one is false. For any buffer system, the buffer capacity depends on the amount of acid and base from which the buffer is made, and that is true. Okay, the buffer capacity is going to depend on the amount of uh, acid and base that you have in the solution. And buffers resist change in pH upon addition of small amounts of strong acid or strong bases. That also is true. That's the definition of a buffer. So this is all with the second part, true or false. Now let's move to the third part that was um, multiple choice. The first one says, at equilibrium, all, react all chemical reactions have ceased. The rates of the four reaction and reverse reactions are equal. So that's basically the definition of equilibrium when both the reaction and the reverse reactions, the rates of the forward and reverse reaction are the same. Number two, which one of the following will change the value of the equilibrium constant? Changing the temperature, adding other substances that do not react with any of the other involved in the equilibrium, varying the initial concentration of reactant, varying the initial concentration of products, changing the volume of the, of the reaction base vessel. So from B to E, all of this, what they're going to do is basically shift the equilibrium, but they're not going to change the constant. The temperature is going to change the constant, the equilibrium constant. So that's why it's letter A. Number three, given the following reaction of equilibrium, if Kc is equal to 1.90 times 10 to the power of minus of 19 at 25 degrees Celsius, the Kp is going to be equal to what? So if we, you go uh, at the end of the test, you have a few formulas, and there you have one that says Kp is equal to Kc times Rt uh, to the power of the change in number of moles. So here, the change in number of moles, you can see here that you have two moles in the reactant, and one and two moles in the product, I mean, two moles in the, re in the products, and one and two moles in the reactant. The difference between them is going to be zero. Two minus two is going to be zero. So this here is going to be zero. So if this is zero, when you uh, uh, elevate this to a power of zero, it's going to be equals to one. So that means that the Kp is going to be equals to the Kc. So here the Kc is going to be 1.90 times to the 10 to the power of 19. Because the change here in moles is going to be zero, 2 and 2, 2 minus is 0, and this is going to be equal to 1. When this is elevated to 0 is equal to 1, so all this part is equal to 1, so Kc is equal to Kp. So that's why it's letter D. Number 4, which of the following expression is correct? Is a correct equilibrium constant expression for the reaction below? So here we have hydrophobic acid, that is a weak acid, okay, that's why it's an equilibrium here, plus water. It's going to create a hydronium ion and the fluoride ion. So um, here we know that water is not part of the equation because it's the solvent. You have a lot of water there, and even though they're reacting a little bit with the uh, hydrophobic acid, but the amount is so small that it's, going to, it's, not going to, it's not going to change the concentration of water. So that's why it's not part. You're going to keep water constant. So that's why H2O can be part of the equation. So in that way, you can basically remove a and you can remove a C, okay? <clears throat> and then um, now you don't have water as part of the equation. So we need to have all the other three as part of the equation. As you can see, B has just the HF, so B can be there. And also the last one, the E. So it's going to be H3O and uh, hydronium ion and chloride ion as a reactant. They're going to be, as a product, they're going to be at the top of the equation divided by the product that's going to be the reactant that's going to be HF. Okay, so that's why you have the letter D is your correct answer for number four. Number five, the equilibrium constant for the gas phase reaction, the N2 plus 3H2 producing 2NH3, the Haber reaction, is this one here. So we, we at equilibrium, what is going to happen? The products predominate, the reactant predominates, only products are present, only reactants are present, none of the above. Here we can see that the exponent here is small. Okay, so because it's small, that means that the, 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 when you have the ratio of products divided by 
the reactants, the products are going to be small also, and the reactants are going to be higher. So in that way, you're going to, the, the predominant one is going to be there is going to be the reactant. So it's going to be letter B, okay? So because this number is small, that make this small and this may, may make these big. So the reactants are the ones, the species that are going to be predominant in this equilibrium, letter B. Number six, the value of the constant of equilibrium for the following reaction is 0.26. A times plus B, producing or at equilibrium with C plus D. The value of the constant equilibrium of the same temperature for the reaction below is, so we can see here that we basically duplicate the concentration of each of them. And when we go, uh, we recall again the expression of Kc, but we did basically this coefficient is going to be the exponent of each of them, and we square each of them. So that means that if we square this one, we must square also the Kc. So that's why 0.26 square is going to be equal to 0.068, and that will be the answer for letter for number six. Letter A, 0 .0, 0 0.068, okay, because we basically duplicate the concentration here. That will affect the equilibrium, uh, constant of equilibrium, by um, square each of them. And because we square this um, value here, basically we need to square also the Kc. Number seven, how is the react reaction coefficient used to determine whether a system is at equilibrium? Well, you know that you can use the re reaction coefficient any time during the reaction, even though in equilibrium. So when that number is equal to the constant of equilibrium, then the reaction is in equilibrium. So that's why it's letter E. When the Q is equal to the constant of equilibrium, we reach that equilibrium. Number eight of the following equilibria, only blank, will shift to the left in response to a decrease in volume. So because we are here talking about um, volumes and it's gonna be affected by the volume, we're talking about gases. So if we are decreasing the volume, that means that uh, we need to, it's gonna, it's gonna be shift the equilibrium toward the one that has the lower number of moles. And if we want to make that go to the left, that means that basically we need to have in the reactant the small number of moles of both of reactant and products. So here we have one mole and one mole, this is gonna be two moles. And we have two moles here, so it's not this because both of them are the same. The volume is not gonna affect it's not going to go through left or right. It's going to be the same. So we want to go to the left. So we have here two moles here in the in the reactants and three in the products. If you decrease the volume to this reaction, that would turn this to make to the left because here we have just two. Here we have four and here we have two. This will make that decreasing in volume to, to shift the equilibrium to the right. Here we have three and four. We have seven moles here, two moles here. The same thing. We, we're going to go toward... The, the the shift that that has a lower number of moles so seven and two is going to go to the to toward the products and two here and two here is not going to be affected so letter b is the one that is going to be affected okay so it's going to basically shift to the left because we have the lower number of moles in the left as compared to the right we have two here and we have three here and this will basically uh feel the this kind of effect by decreasing the volume is going to shift to the left so it's letter b Number nine, in which of the following reactions would increase in pressure at constant temperature, temperature not change the concentrations of reactants and products based on Le Chatelier's principle? So if there's no change, is it gonna be affected? That change in pressure is due to that the number of moles in reactants are the same as the number of moles in the products. So here we have four and two, this will be affected. We have one and two, this equilibrium will be affected. We have one and two, it's gonna be three. You know, we here in the products we are gonna have two. So this equilibrium also will be affected. We have three moles here in the reactant, two of nitrogen, one of oxygen. And we have two of the dinitrogen oxide here. So that's one also is gonna be, is, the, is this one is gonna be affected. Here we have one, two moles in the reactants, two moles in the product. This one is not gonna be affected by that change in pressure, so that's why it's letter E. Number nine is gonna be letter E. Number 10, which one of the following is a bronsted lowry acid? The bronsted lowry acid is the one that donates hydrogen, so they must have hydrogens available. And here we have these three ethylamine that is protonated, and this hydrogen can be donated. Acetic acid here, this is an acid by, by definition, as well as uh, um, HF and HNO2, so all of them are basically acid that has the ability 
to donate that proton, so it's letter E, all of the above. The molar concentration of hydroxide ion in pure water at 25 degrees Celsius is, well, we know that in, 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 in water, we have an equilibrium between H3O and OH, and we, that equilibrium is uh, established or um, regulated by a constant that is the KW. And KW is equal to the concentration of the hydron uh, ion and the hydroxide ion. And this number is going to be equal to 1.0 times 10 to the power of minus 14. Because we are basically in pure water, both concentrations are going to be the same. So we can look for the root square of this number, or sorry, divide this by 2, because there's going to be two of them. So we're going to have 2x here, and divide this by 2, and we're going to have the value of 1.0 times 210 of the power of minus 7. And that will be the concentration of hydroxide ion, ion. That is the same of the hydronium ion in water at 25 degrees. Number 12, which one of the following is the weakest acid? We have here hydrochloric acid, we have here hypochlorous acid, as well as nitrous acid. And to know which one is the weakest acid, we need to look for the Ka. The one that has the smallest Ka is going to be the one that is the weakest acid. So minus 4, minus 8, this is the weakest compared with this one. Minus 4, this is still the weakest. Minus 10, this one is the weakest. Minus 5. So HCN, basically the hydrogen cyanide, is the weakest acid from this list. The one that has the lowest constant acid. Number 13, what is the conjugated acid of H2PO4? If I'm looking for the conjugated acid of this base, we need to add one hydrogen to this one. It's going to be H3PO4. It's going to be letter D, H3PO4. Okay, because this one is the base, and we're looking for the conjugated acid. So we need to add one hydrogen here, and that would be letter D, the H3PO4. Number 14, calculate the pOH of a solution at 25 degrees Celsius that contains 1.94 times 10 to the power of minus 10 hydronium ions. So we need to calculate the pOH, and we have the concentration of H positive. So by this, we can basically calculate the pH using this concentration. pH is going to be equal to the minus log of this concentration here. So pH is going to be equal to 9.71. Now the pOH is going to be equal to the pH or 40 minus pH, that is going to be this next equation. So 40 minus 9.71 is going to be equal to 4.29, and this is the pOH of the solution, that is letter B for number 14, 4.29. Number 15, which equilibrium corresponds to the equilibrium constant Ka for HA? So here we know that HA is an acid, and this must be part of the equation as a reactant. So we can basically eliminate B because we don't have HA here, as well as D, we don't have HA as part of the products of the reactant, sorry. And in letter E, we don't have HA neither as part of the reactant. Now, we know that HA is an acid because we have the Ka here and we start with an H here. So this will react as an acid and will react with water. Okay, so water is going to receive that hydrogen, so you're going to produce H3O positive. So in the products, we must have H3O, this H2A, OH, H3O here, so that means that it's going to be letter C. Letter C is going to be the uh, equilibrium that corresponds to the equilibrium constant of HA. Number 16, using the data in the table, which of the conjugated bases below is the strongest basis? So all of these are conjugated bases of these acids here. If you have a strong acid, you will produce a weak base. If you have a strong, a weak acid, you're going to produce a weak base. Okay. So if you have, once again, if you have a strong acid, you will produce a weak base. If you have a weak acid, you're going to produce a strong base. So if you're looking for a strong base, we must look here for which one is the weakest acid. And once again, we look for the Ka's. The ones that has the lowest Ka is going to be the weakest acid that's going to produce the strongest base. So here's going to be 10 to the minus 8. It's going to be basically the small Ka. So that means that the hypochlorous acid is going to be the weakest acid. So a conjugated base, that is basically hypochlorite here, is going to be the stronger base of this list. Okay, so we have here the minus 8. 
because it's the weakest acid, and the weakest acid is going to produce the strongest base, so it's going to be Cl ClO hypochlorite ion. It's going to be the stronger base. Number 17, the pH of 0 0.55 molar aqueous solution of hy hypobromous acid, HBRO, at 25 degrees is 4.48. That's the pH. What is the Ka value of HBRO? So the first thing that we should do is basically uh, draw the equilibrium for HBRO. We have here HBRO produced to H positive and BRO. And we know that in the initial concentration that we have here is 0.55 of this one and zero of the acid, zero of the uh, bromide ion here, the hyperbro hyper hyperbromic ion, and also hy hyperbromide, hyperbromide ion, sorry. Um, and also we then, the chain is gonna be minus X, minus plus X, plus S in the products, and the in equilibrium is gonna be 0 0.55 minus X, X for H positive and H for the ion of hyperbromide ion. We have the pH. The pH, from that pH, we can calculate the concentration of H positive. So pH is gonna be equal to 4.48, and we can basically establish that the 10 to the minus pH is gonna be equal to the concentration of H positive. So 10 to the power of minus 4.48 is gonna be the concentration of H positive, and that is gonna be 3.31 times 10 to the power of minus five. This value here is equal to the value of X, okay, because this represent the concentration of hydronium ion at equilibrium, so this is X. So we can basically, right now, the constant equilibrium is gonna be H positive times the hypobromide um, ion divided by the hypobromose uh, acid, and then the concentration of X, this is gonna be squared because X are the same, so it's gonna be X squared here, so we put this concentration here squared, and the concentration of HBRO at equilibrium because it's a weak acid is not going to be affected if you divide basically what well here basically you have this when you subtract this minus this it's going to be 0.55 so it's not affected so now you divide this value by this one and we're going to have that the ka is going to be equal to 2.0 times 10 to the power of minus 9 and that will be letter a our answer right answer for number 17. For number 18, the Ka of acetic acid is 1.8 times 10 to the power of minus 5. What is the pH of 25 degree, at 25 degrees of an aqueous solution? That is 0.1 molar of acetic acid. Once again, we need to write the equation, or basically the Ka, Ka here. The K, we can establish use this same example here. Ka is going to be equal to the H positive on the acetate ion divided by the acetic acid. That's basically the same here. And now we know that. Um, the pH we, we have here that the concentration of acetic acid is this one so we have the Ka and we have this also the um, concentration of acetic acid so this is going to be x squared here this is our x both of them we have these two values so x squared is going to be equal to the Ka that is this one here and times the concentration of the acetic acid that is this one here and we don't have to do the 100 minus x because if you divide this concentration times the, the Ka, that's gonna be larger than 1,000. So that is not gonna affect the concentration of the acetic acid at equilibrium. So that way we can multiply that and we can have the x squared is gonna be equals to 1.8 times 10 to the minus six. Now the root square of this is gonna be what equals to 1.34 times 10 to the power of minus three. This x is gonna be equal to the concentration of the hydronium ion as well as the acetate. We are looking for the pH, so the concentration of the acid, the acid is going to be 1.34 times 10 to the minus 3. Minus log of that is going to be 2.87. That's going to be the pH of the solution. That is going to be letter A, 2.87. If you forgot to use the minus, it's going to give you here A minus, and that will be letter B, so that's why it's wrong. So remember that the definition is pH is equal to minus log of this value here. Going forward to number 19, the acid dissociation constant Ka for the gallic acid is 4.57 times 10 to the power of minus 3. What is the base dissociation constant, the Kb, for the gallic ion? So we have Ka and Kb. We can use the equation that is Kw is, qu is equal to the constant of acid uh, times the constant of the base. We can divide the Kw by Kb, and there we have, I mean, I mean by Ka, and by there we can uh, determine the Kb. So we 
kw is equal to 1.0 times 2 to the 10 to the power of minus 14 divided by the ka here is going to give you the value of the kb that is 2.19 times 10 to the power of minus 12 that is the letter b so 19 is letter b number 20 which one of the following pairs cannot be mixed together to form a buffer solution you may know that to create a buffer solution you may use a um, weak acid and its conjugated base so by far well as you can see here you have hcl here hcl is a strong acid so that that is basically the one that you can't use it because you can't use strong acid to create a buffer solution okay so that's why it's letter b Number 21, what change will it cause or will be caused by addition of a small amount of HCl to a solution containing fluoride ions and hydrogen fluoride? So that means that we're going to have HF here at equilibrium producing the fluoride ion and H positive. If we add a small amount of HCl, that means that HCl is a strong acid. So in solution, is going to be completely dissociated. So we're going to have H positive ions. So that's going to increase this concentration. But because we are in equilibrium, when you increase this concentration, this is going to shift to the left, decreasing the concentration of fluoride ions. Okay, so when you add a little bit of hydrochloric acid that is a strong acid that we that will be dissociated completely, you're going to increase the concentration of H positive in the solution. And because of that, this equilibrium will shift to the left to reduce this concentration, but at the same time, you're going to reduce this concentration. So, you're going to increase this concentration and reduce this one. The concentration of hydrogen ions will increase significantly. That's just false. The concentration of fluoride ions will increase. Nope. The concentration of flu uh, hydrogen fluoride ion will decrease. No, because if you shift to the left, you're going to increase this concentration. The concentration of fluoride ion will decrease, and the concentration of hydrogen fluoride ions will increase. Yes, you're, go you're going to decrease this concentration, and you're going to increase this one. The fluoride ions will precipitate? No. So that's basically this letter D. Okay, your correct answer for number 21. When you add this amount of H positive, it's going to increase, make to increase this one. And that will shift the equilibrium to the left, decreasing this concentration and increasing the HF concentration. Number 22 of the following solution, which has the greatest buffering capacity. The greatest buffering capacity associated with the concentration of each of them. So the ones that has the highest concentration, that one's going to have, have the greatest buffering capacity. So here, as we can see here, we have 0.8 here and 0.7 here. This is uh, larger than any of the, uh, the other three as well as here. So basically, B is the right answer because we have they're the highest concentration for both, making them the buffer with the greatest capacity of buffering. Number 23, I put the graphic there and I forgot to put uh, the question so that's basically your bonus for you I just give you two points there for you number 24 a 25 mils sample of a solution of a monoprotic acid is titrated with a 0.50 molar sodium hydroxide solution the titration cur curve is this one here the concentration of the monoprotic acids is about and we need to calculate the concentration of that monoprotic acid. So we are doing a titration of this monoprotic acid with the sodium hydroxide. We can see here the uh, calibrate uh, curve of titration here. And at the equivalence point, you know that you basically consume all the acid because you are doing the titration with the base. You, are, you consume all the acid um, from the sample. So that means that if we use this volume here of 25 mils, we can calculate the, the, the ions of hy uh, hydroxide ion that were used to consume all the ions from the monoprotic acid. So the millimoles of sodium hydroxide will be 25 milliliters, because we have here 25 milliliters, times the concentration of the sodium hydroxide. And that will be equal to 2.88 moles or millimoles of sodium hydroxide. And because it's a monoprotic acid, we have just one proton here. That proton will going go to react with one of OH. So the um, stoichiometry is going to be one to one. So that means that the moles of sodium hydroxide are going to be equal to the millimoles of the monoprotic acid. And now for the concentration, basically, well, we have here 2.88 millimoles of the uh, monoprotic acid. So the concentration is going to be equal to 2.88 millimoles divided by 25. That was the sample, the volume of the sample. 
and this is going to be equal to 0 0.115 and here we have 0 0.12 so basically it's about around that uh, concentration so we have letter D that is 0 0.120 molar. Number 25, the KSP4, the zinc hydroxide, is 5.0 times 10 to the power of minus 17. Determine the molar solubility of zinc hydroxide in a buffer solution with a pH of 11.5. So for the zinc hydroxide, uh, that is basically a solid here, we dissociate that to zinc and 2 moles of hydroxide ion. So now we basically can establish that KSP is going to be equal to the concentration of the zinc times the concentration of OH squared, okay, because this is basically the KSP. We don't use the zinc hydroxide because this is a solid. And now we can uh, and change the change is going to be minus x here for zinc and 2x for OH. So we can basically now determine the concentration of, uh, we have the pH. With the pH, we can determine the concentration of H positive. And the concentration of H positive, we can calculate the OH. Or also, we can basically turn this to POH and calculate the concentration of OH. So POH is going to be equal to 14 minus 11.5. That will be 2.5. This is the POH of the solution. So from here, we can calculate the concentration of hydroxide by using the 10 to the minus PX, uh, power to the minus POH. And that will be equal to 10 to the minus of uh, power of minus 2.5. Concentration of OH is going to be equal to 3.16 times to 10 to the power of minus 3. So this is going to be the concentration of OH here. So we have the concentration of OH. We have the KSP here. So we can calculate X. X is the molar solubility, okay, because this is X here. So by saying that X is going to be equal to the concentration of the zinc ion, that is going to be equal to the KSP divided by the hydroxide ion's concentration square. So we just subs that now this values here in the corresponding um, variable. So KSP is 5.0 times 10 to the power of minus 17 divided by the concentration of OH squared. And the X is going to be equal to 5.0 times 10 to the minus 12. So X is going to be letter, the answer for 25 is going to be letter D, 5.0 times 10 to the minus 12. And this will be all for the section of the multiple choice. Now we're going to the problem number <clears throat> section that's number three. Number one, hydrogen and iodine gas react together to form hydrogen iodide gas. The equation for this reaction is this one here. We have an equilibrium here. The equilibrium constant for this reaction is 7.1 times 10 to the power of 2 at 25 degrees. If the current concentration of gases are for hydrogen, we have 0.81. For the iodide, we have 0.44. For the iodine, sorry. And for the hydrogen iodide, we have 0.58. What direction will the reaction shift to reach equilibrium? Because we don't know that we, if we are or not in equilibrium, we're going to use the uh, reaction coefficient, the Q. Okay, That is going to be the same expression of the K, but we can use this in a different part of the reaction, even though they are not at equilibrium. And by doing this, we can calculate the Q and compare, compare that with the Kc, or the constant of equilibrium. So... The concentration of uh, the hydrogen iodide is 0. Um, 0.58. So we sub all those values here. The concentration of hydrogen is going to be 0. 0.81. The concentration of the iodide, iodine is going to be 0. 0.44. We calculate there the Q. We uh, square this and then multiply this. We're going to have this here. The red means that this is the um, significant uh, figures that we have by the, the products, okay? So we have 2 and 2. And when the good divide is going to be 0 0.94, that's going to be Q. When you compare Q to the Kc, you can see that the K of equilibrium is going to be, the Q is going to be lower than the constant of equilibrium. So because of that, the equilibrium is going to shift to the right. So we can increase that concentration of the Hi until you reach that equilibrium. Okay, So that's why uh, the equilibrium turns to the right because the Q is going to be is smaller than the constant of equilibrium established here. Number two, in the coal's gasification process, carbon monoxide is converted to carbon dioxide via the following reaction. Carbon monoxide plus water is in equilibrium for the carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Here all are in the gas phase, okay? So that's why we consider also hydrogen as part of the reactants. It's not the solvent, so it's one of the reactants. In the experiment, we have 0.35 moles of carbon monoxide. We have 0.40 moles of water. 
and we place all of that in one liter vessel. So at equilibrium, there were 0.22 moles of carbon monoxide remaining. So this is what you have at equilibrium. So the constant equilibrium at temperature, we need to calculate the constant of equilibrium. So we basically create the ice table. Initially, we have 0.35 moles or molar because we have just one liter. So this is 0.35 molar of carbon monoxide as well as 0.40 of water. And we don't have nothing in carbon dioxide, neither the uh, hydrogen. And the change is going to be minus x in the reactant and plus x in the products. At equilibrium, the carbon monoxide is going to be 0.35 minus x, 0.40 minus x for water, and x and x for carbon dioxide and hydrogen. We mentioned that we have 0.22 molar at the equilibrium. So because of that, we can... Uh, we can basically establish that 0.22 is going to be equal to 0.35 minus x. We can calculate the x from here, the difference that was uh, x, uh, here in, in, the, in the reaction. So x is going to be equal to 0.13. So by doing that, now we know the value of x. We can uh, determine the concentration of each of the species in at equilibrium. So we have at equilibrium, carbon monoxide is 0.22 molar, okay, because that is established by the problem. For water, we have 0.40 minus 0.13, that's going to be 0.27. And for carbon dioxide, we're going to have 0.13 and for hydrogen, 0.13. So now we can sub this in the equilibrium constant, that is this one, B products over the reactants here. And we can have this expression. Let me multiply both of them. And then we divide this, it's going to be equal to 0 0.28, 0 0.2845. And because we have just two significant figures, the constant of equilibrium is going to be equal to point, 0 0.28. So this is how you solve the problem number two of your test. Problem number three, what is the pH of a 0 0.20 molar solution of weak acid, jasper's ammonium bromide? The Kb value for jasper amine is 4.0 times 10 to the power of minus 5. So we have here the jasper ammonium bromide uh, the acid, okay, so uh, HJA is going to be that acid. Plus water is going to produce the jasper amide here and the uh, H3O. So here we have the initial concentration 0.20. We have 0 and 0. We don't count this because uh, this is the solvent, so it's not going to affect the concentration of water. So minus, minus X is a change, plus X, and plus X is going to be the change in the products. So at equilibrium, we're going to have 0.20 minus x of the weak acid, and point and x and x for the base and H3O. Now, we're talking here about the, we need to calculate the pH. We have the Kb. So from the Kb, um, you can calculate using the Kw, the Ka. So Kw divided by the Kb is going to be equal to the Ka, that is going to be 2.5 times 10 to the power of minus 10. So we have Ka here. We can sub these values in this equation here. We have 2.5, that is the Ka obtained from the Kb. We have the equilibrium uh, concentrations for the products as well as the reactant. And if you divide the Ka by the, K, by the concentration of the weak acid, you will see that you have the different, that the ratio is going to be larger than 1,000. So because of that, that concentration of the weak acid is not going to be affected at equilibrium. So we can basically remove that X. So now we can multiply this times this, and that will be equal to x squared. And when we look for the root square of x, it's going to be equal to 5.0 times 10 to the power of minus 11. Now this x here, well, this is x squared. And the x, when you take the root square, it's going to be 7.07 .07 times 10 to the power of minus 6. Sorry about that. This is the value of x. And x represents also the concentration of H3O. We are looking for the pH. So we can use this now to determine the pH. The pH is equals to the minus log of this value, that is the concentration of H3O. So the pH is going to be equal to 5.15051 because we have two significant figures. The pH is going to be equal to 5.2. That will be the answer for problem number three. The pH of that solution is going to be 5.2. Problem number four, calculate the maximum concentration in molar units 
of silver ions in a solution that contains 0.025 molar of carbon. It's CO3 minus 2. And the uh, KSP is equals for H for silver carbonate is 8.1 times 10 to the power of minus 12. So we can basically write the equilibrium for this solid. We're going to produce two silvers and the carbonate ion. And we know that we have the KSP is going to be equals to this representation, the concentration of Ag square and the concentration of the carbonate. And we're looking for the con maximum concentration of Ag. So to do that now, we can basically have here the concentration, the KSP, and we have the concentration of the carbonate. So we can put subs this value here. The concentration of Ag square is going to be equals to the KSP divided by the concentration of the carbonate. And that will be equals to 3.24 times 10 to the minus 10 power of minus 10. And when we look for the root square of that value, the concentration of silver ion is going to be equal to 1.8 times to 10 to the power of minus 5 molar. So that will be the maximum concentration of the silver ions present in this solution. Problem number five, calculate the percent ionization of formic acid in a solution that is 0 0.32, 0 0.322 molar in formic acid and 0 0.178 molar in sodium formate. The Ka for the formic acid is 1.77 times 10 to the power of minus 4. So we can write again the, uh, well, the equation of percent of ionization is equal to the concentration of H3O at equilibrium divided by the initial concentration of the weak acid. So from the equation, we have this information here because the, that, <coughs> that value is 0 0.322. That's the concentration of the formic acid that is my weakest acid. So the initial... HA is basically, we represent it here, the A as an acid, but it's in this case going to be HF as a formic acid, and this is the initial concentration. So the equilibrium is going to be HF producing the fluoride ion plus the hydronium ion. I forgot here the plus, sorry about that. And at, uh, when we uh, create the ice table, we're going to have initially 0 0.32 uh, molar of the hydrofluoric acid and 0 0.178 molar of the fluoride ion and zero of the hydro hydronium ion. We need to calculate this concentration at equilibrium. So the change is going to be minus x minus plus x and plus s for the uh, products. And at equilibrium, we're going to have 0 0.322 minus x of the hydrofluoric acid, 0 0.178 plus x of the fluoride ion, and we're going to have x for the hydronium ion. Now, here we can basically... Um, Look for the, uh, the uh, representation of the constant acid. It's going to be F, the concentration of fluoride ion times the concentration of hydronium ion, divided by the concentration of the hydrofluoride fluoric acid. And we can sub all these uh, um, values here at equilibrium in that equation. And we're going to have that is, is going to be the Ka. We have the Ka here, 1.77 times 10 to the power of minus 4 equals to the concentration of fluoride ion that's going to be 0 0.78 178 minus x the concentration of h3o that's going to be basically x here we don't know that yet and uh the concentration of 0.322 minus x is the concentration of the hydrofluoric acid now if we divide the concentration of the hydrofluoric acid by the ka as well as the concentration of the uh, formate here by the ka we're going to see that that ratio is going to be larger than 1000 so because of that, we can remove that x from both of them. And now we can basically establish this equation here. And we can calculate here the concentration of H3O by multiplying the constant acid times the concentra initial concentration of the weak acid divided by the concentration of the base. That is going to be something like this. And now the concentration of H3O positive is going to be equal to 3.20 times 10 to the power of minus 4 molar. This is the concentration of the acid at equilibrium, the one that we need to put here. So now going back to this equation, we can put the concentration of the acid at equilibrium here, the concentration of the weak acid initially here times 100, and that's going to be equals to 0.0994% of that acid is going to be dissociated in solution. And that will be the answer for number 5, 0.0994%. 
And the last problem, number six, calculate the pH of a buffer prepared by combining 50 milliliters of one molar of potassium benzoate and 50 milliliters of one molar of benzoic acid. The Ka for benzoic acid is 6.30 times 10 to the minus, uh, power of minus five. So there are two different ways that you can approach this uh, problem. The first one is doing the Hermann Hazel back equation using the pH is equal to pKa plus the log of the concentration of the base and the acid. Here, because the concentration is basically the same, okay, you can basically uh, this is gonna the log of this is gonna be zero. This is divided by this is gonna be one. So the log of one is gonna be zero. So that means that P, the pH is gonna be equal to the pKa. So we have the Ka here. Okay, so the pKa is going to be equal to minus log of 6.30 times to the power of minus 5. So that will be equal to 4.20. And because of this, the pH is going to be equal to the pKa. So this, one, this was one way to approach this problem. The pH of the solution is going to be 4.20. Another way to approach this problem is using basically the ice table. So we have Hb, that is the um, benzoic acid, producing the benzoate here and the H3O. And I forgot again to place the plus here. Sorry about that. Um, the initial concentration for both is going to be 1 and 1, and for the hydronium ion is going to be 0. The change during the process of the equilibrium is going to be minus x for the reactants plus x to the products. At equilibrium, we're going to have 1 minus x for the uh, benzoic acid, 1 plus x for the benzoate uh, ion, and x for the hydronium ion. So we can basically uh, establish the equation of Ka is going to be equal to the Conjugated base times the concentration of the hydronium ion divided by the concentration of the weak acid. And we can sub this values here at equilibrium. We have 0.1 minus x, that is the concentration of the benzoic acid at equilibrium. It's going to be in the bottom part. And we're going to put the concentration of the base, conjugated base here, and the concentration of hydronium ion here. Now, if you divide this concentrations of both by this value here this is going to be larger but much larger than 1000 so that means that this x is not going to affect the concentration of them so we can basically remove that x from there and now we see that those concentrations are the same so because they are the same we also can cancel them so the concentration of h3 is going to be equal to the ka so now if we're looking for the ph we basically put the minus log of this is going to be equal to 4.20, the same value that we have when if we use the Henderson uh, as a back equation, okay, in, in the previous slide, when we show the other way to approach this problem. So the pH was 4.20 for this buffer. The bonus was um, a problem that involved the titration of a uh, sample of potassium hydroxide with an acid that is known as perchloric acid, okay? So we titrate this solution. We have a 20 milliliter sample of 0.150 molar of potassium hydroxide. And it was titrated with this solution of 0.125 molar of perchloric acid. We need to calculate the pH of the solution whenever we add a specific volume of this acid, okay? So the first thing that we, we should do is basically determine, we have here the reaction that's gonna be OH from the potassium and one Hydrogen from the perchloric acid and going to produce water. So you're neutralizing this concentration, I mean, this, this solution with the perchloric acid. So the first part is going to be determine the millimoles of hydroxide in the sample. So by to do that, we multiply the volume times the concentration of it, and it's going to be equal to 3 millimoles of hydroxide ion. This is the millimoles that we have in the sample. In the first step, we add 20 mils of the perchloric acid. So we need to determine the millimoles of hydrogen that we add. So it's going to be equals uh, the volume of the acid times the concentration of the acid. 20 milliliters times 0.125 molar is going to be equal to 2.50 millimoles of hydrogen ions that we have. So now we need to determine the millimoles that are left when both of these react. So as you can see here, 2.50 millimoles of the hydrogen will react with 2.50 millimoles of the hydroxide and we will left 0.50 millimoles of hydroxide with that reaction. So because of this, now we can calculate the concentration of OH that will be equal to the 0.50 millimoles of hydroxide ions divided by the total volume that we have now, that's gonna be 20 milliliters of the sample and 20 milliliters of 
the one that we add here of the hypochloric acid, of the perchloric acid, sorry, and that will be equal to 0.125 molar. This is the concentration of hydroxide ion. Now we can calculate the pOH, so it's going to be equals to the minus log of this concentration here, that is going to be 1.90. And now we can basically calculate the pH of the solution by 14 minus 1.9 is going to be 12.10. So this is the pH of that solution when you have when you add 20 ml of the perchloric acid. In B, we have we add 20 at this point we have added 23 milliliters of the perchloric acid. We add three more milliliters, so we still have the same number of moles of hydroxide ion. So we need to determine the moles millimoles of uh, hydronium ion that we have now. So we add 23 milliliters of this concentration, we're going to have 2.88 millimoles of the hydro hydronium ion. Now we need to know how much we are left of any of those. So we have 2.88 of this that react with 2.88 of the hydroxide, and we have left 0.12 of the hydroxide ion because we have more, still more of the hydroxide ion in solution. And because of that, we need to calculate now the concentration of OH. So we have 0.12 millimoles that are left because 2.88 react with the 2.88 of the hydronium ion that we add here. So 0.12 divided by 20 milliliters of the solution of the sample and 23 that we add here. So it's going to be 0.12 divided by 43 is going to be equal to 0 0.0028 molar. This is the concentration of OH. So we can calculate the pOH using this concentration. It's going to be equal to 2.55. And now the pH is going to be equal to 14 minus this, so it's going to be 11.45. So this is the pH when you add 23 ml of the perchloric acid to the sample of potassium hydroxide. In letter C, we add 25 ml of the perchloric acid. So now we need to calculate how many millimoles do we have of hydronium ion in solution. It's going to be 25 times this concentration and we have 3.13 millimoles of hydronium ion. Here we can see that we have more than the hydroxide. So that means that we consume in this point all of the hydroxide ions in solution. So we're going to have 3.13 millimoles react with 3 moles, millimoles of hydroxide ion and we're going to let 0.13 millimoles of the hydronium ion. So with this we can calculate now the concentration of hydronium ion. It's going to be 0.13 divided by the total volume that we have now, that's going to be 45, and it's going to be equal to 0 0.028 molar. And this is the concentration of hydronium at this point. So from here, we can calculate the pH of the solution by looking at minus log of this concentration, it's going to be 2.53, and this is the pH at this point of the 25 milliliters adding of the perchloric acid to the 25, 20 milliliter sample of 1.50 molar of potassium hydroxide. And the last one was, what was the pH when we add 30 ml of the perchloric solution to the sample? So now we can calculate the moles of hydronium ion. We multiply this volume here times the concentration, and we're going to have 3.75 millimoles of the hydronium ion. Then we can calculate how many do we have left. For this react with the 3 millimoles of hydroxide ion, we're going to have left 0.75 millimoles of the hydronium ion. We can calculate now the concentration of the hydronium ion directly from here, divided by the total volume that's going to be 50. So it's going to be 0.75 divided by 20 plus 30. And the concentration now is going to be 0 0.050 molar of the hydronium, hydronium ion. Now we can calculate pH by using this concentration. Minus log of uh, 0 0.015 is going to be equal to 1.82. This will be the pH of the solution after you add 30 ml of the, the perchloric acid to the 20 milliliter sample of potassium hydroxide. And this will be all for the review of the test. If you have any question, please let me know. Um, if you have, I've, I've grade something wrong on your test or whatever thing, just uh, you, you know how to contact me and we'll see you soon.